This Future Construct podcast episode is supported by Applied Software. Applied Software is on a mission to transform industry by empowering their clients and championing innovation with real world expert consultants. So visit asti.com, it's A-S-T-I.com, and please let them know that we here at Future Construct and BIM Designs sent you. Hi, welcome to the Future Construct podcast. I am your host, Amy Peck. Today, we have a fantastic guest, Dr. Connie Scheitz, who is the director of the Technology Centers Network at Autodesk. Welcome, Connie. Hi, Amy. Nice to meet you. I'm glad to be here. So first, I want to get into your history and your and your journey to where you are today, but what happens at the Technology Centers Network at Autodesk? We invite innovators from across the globe that work either in manufacturing, construction, um, or media and entertainment to really bring their innovations to life in our space, whether that's software or actually in the workshop. And we get to see them collaborate and make really interesting innovations that push us forward um, as a people. No, and I, I definitely want to hear more about that because I think there are going to be some very interesting technologies that you are you are privy to and that you get to see before anybody else. But you've had a really long and interesting career, and you have a background in life sciences. So can you talk a little bit about your journey and how you kind of came to Autodesk? Yeah, that's been definitely not on my radar when I started. Um, very untraditional, so to say, but then who again these days has a traditional career? <laughs> um, so I started out in life sciences and probably when I was in ninth grade, I was like, I want to do genetics. I was totally fascinated with how um, humans come to be, how any form of life really comes to be out of the basic building blocks um, that are DNA, RNA, and protein. And so I had this great dream that I would win a Nobel prize Clearly that did not happen. Um, and I There's still did time. There's my... still time. <laughs> that is true. However, I have um, given up on that dream. Um, does not seem really realistic um, for how you get there also. But I uh, joined academia because I thought um, that's how I can move the needle. I was really excited about finding out new ways we can make our lives better and um, specifically from the biology side of things. Um, and during my PhD, I identified a new mechanism for skin cancer that could also be druggable down the line. What was frustrating is that that's great basic research and there's a publication on that, actually two, but until that ever gets into some form of treatment or somebody looks into this and it actually makes a difference, that could be decades or also never. <laughs> and I wanted to do something that actually made a difference to people and had an impact. Uh, so applied research or applying my knowledge generally was something that I was passionate about. And that's how I joined a startup and we were trying to automate life sciences um, from beginning to end, lights out laboratory automation. So you could sit in a Starbucks, code up your experiment and the automation in a different state country would run it and you would get results. So we did that for about three, three and a half years. Um, and the company is still going strong. Uh, but I decided to join Autodesk down the line to really expand the areas that I look at. Because during this work at what is called Transcriptic, I really identified we can automate anything that we want, but how it works together with the people who are actually doing the work, that's the crucial part. Um, it's a give and take between people and process and business, and only when these come together in harmony, that's when we create impact and move something forward. See, I, I love the way you articulated that because I think you're you're so right. And, and it's, I think also there's so much fear, even just around the word auto, automation. And it really, is a it's a it's a combination right it's a collaboration between human and machine so i'd love to maybe expand on that a little bit more and, and sort of talk about some of the things that you've seen and some of the advancements yeah i mean just from my personal experience in the beginning right it sounds scary when you hear automation is going to do your job but I always ask, what job is it actually going to do? So during my PhD, you have to do a lot of pipetting of clear liquids from one location to another. I was great at that. Is that really what made me a valuable member of this laboratory? 
Not really. It was the thought process of why I was pipetting things from A to B. And a robot would be much better in the pipetting steps than I was. So to me, it was exciting to then work together with robots or automation to get the thoughts that I had in my head on how it should look like into the actual vials that we use in science and then get the results and interpret it. And so similarly, I also think in other industries, a lot of the great work is about identifying how we would do it. But then if it's a repeatable process, a human doesn't have to do that. Like a robot can do it and you get the time to do the thing that you're actually great at, which is identifying what the robot should do and then interpreting the results from what was done for you. Um, and that can really be a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, I, and I think that's, that is really interesting because, you know, if you, especially now where automation is and what it's capable of, if you're doing a job where that particular task can be replaced by a robot, to your point, is that really a good use of your time? And, and so, you know, within, let's, let's sort of move back into the technology centers and maybe some of the technologies that you're seeing there. Um, even besides automation, what are some of the trends or even combinations of technologies that you're seeing come through the centers? There are a lot of exciting things that we can see in the technology centers. Um, what I want to preface though, we have about 150 teams, which is exciting to watch, but that's clearly not everything that's going on in the industry. So it's just a small area. And I'm also just bringing the example that I personally am most excited about. Um, and that is actually a collaboration between a startup called Fologram, uh, a construction company called Windover Construction, and then Howick. And Windover Construction, they were doing prefabricated trusses um, made out of steel. And through digital fabrication, they actually produced those all off-site in Boston, about 935 trusses. Um, they were all individual labeled and all different. They were shipped on site. And then on site, the construction workers used Fologram's technology, which is actually an augmented reality headset. And so the construction workers, while also seeing the trusses, could also see the data on where that needs to go, which bolt actually needs to connect into it, and also see the exact alignment um, within millimeters on where that truss would need to be fastened. So within half a day, they produced all these trusses um, and they also were very quickly able to assemble everything on site, which gave them a 70% business impact or cost reduction. And to me, that's a great example where the people connected with the technology, both software and hardware, to actually make a process faster and at least equal accuracy. That's remarkable, and it and it and it does it does show, and it's interesting. You know, on our podcast, we we often have solution providers. And it, it can just be one process that they identify and that they solve for. And the impact is tremendous. Yeah, absolutely. And what I also loved about this example is they didn't come into the technology centers with that as a plan. They each had their own project that they were working on. Um, and those were also interesting. But they met during one of our events and just got talking and that's how it evolved and because it hit the spot for all of them it went from idea to execution within a month and that i think is is the perfect storm when you have you know maybe one or two solution providers they work together because they're coming at problems maybe even different problems from different angles but then you have a customer who's kind of the glue in the middle that says, we're trying to solve this and they each can take a piece of it. Now, how often does that actually happen within the centers or just in general, what, you know, in, in your experience? Yeah, I would say the most exciting projects that we see happen through that. And I would say of all of our 150 teams, there's definitely a very good percentage of folks that are that are connecting regularly and evolving new projects with other partners. Um, some of them are now alumni and are going their own way. Um, Apis Core uh, was a 3D printing or is a 3D printing company. Um, they're building 3D printed housing. Uh, they did their first housing project in Dubai and wanted to bring that technology that technology to the US and they were working uh, with another resident they met, Thornton Tomasetti, to actually get the permitting done for doing that in the US. So this happens 
often, all the time. Um, and that's really why folks join our network is because you can meet somebody who you didn't have on your radar before, especially sometimes from industries also that you know, weren't on your radar to begin with. This episode of the Future Construct podcast is supported by the amazing team at Applied Software. They have solutions for any modern project. Applied Software is on a mission to transform industry by empowering their clients and being the champions of innovation with their real world expert consultants. They have a comprehensive suite of solutions for AEC, MEP and manufacturing, and they have a singular focus to help you achieve higher performance. They have software, training, support, consulting, and custom development. Applied Software has you absolutely covered for all of your workflow needs. And BIM Designs is proud to be a client and partner of Applied Software. So visit ASTI.com, that is A-S-T-I.com, and please let them know that Feature Construct and BIM Designs sent you. Yeah, I, I I love that story. And I and I think we are seeing more and more of that. And And do you find now that you know, whether, you know, within the network or even just beyond that now companies, small companies with sort of completely different specialties, maybe you have a blockchain company. It sounds like you had this sort of prefab company working with an augmented reality company. Are, are people really recognizing that it's these multitude of technologies and kind of the convergence of these emerging technologies, or is it still sort of a tough sell? And it just requires, again, that perfect storm of people meeting. Yeah, I think that's hard for me to say in an in an entirety. Um, we are lucky that we kind of attract the folks who are bought into this notion and see the value that other people are bringing and are passionate about open innovation um, and know that we can't really solve anything in isolation. So those are the folks I get to talk to and I get to meet. And I think with them, it's, it's very accepted that that's the future and then that's how you get to interesting solutions. Um, I don't actually know how it, that feels across yeah, the industry. Yeah. Well, I think, I think we have gotten a good glimpse from, from the examples that you've just shared. And then in terms of, you know, Autodesk, you know, it's interesting now, I mean, I, my focus is in, you know, immersive technology and, hmm. and, and sort of moving from these 2D screens to 3D, to basically 3D space and spatial computing. And of course, Autodesk is situated very, very well for that. Um, with their suite of services, and so do do you see some some sort of act, some active trends either that that you're promoting or that you're looking into, where to really prepare customers for this transition from again 2D screens to you know these wearables that are coming to the market and and really where the whole world is a screen. That is a great question. Um, I think the technologies or the partners that we work with, um, we usually reveal the next generation for that at AU. And I definitely recommend to everybody to join our next AU, which is also virtual, which happens in September. Um, I think everybody um, looks at how do we combine all the different screens we have, whether they're 2D or 3D. I mean, even the move to your phone is something that is much more common now. Uh, for all the work streams we see. And I think there's a lot to come in terms of client independence, um, working also with the partners that Autodesk has. Uh, and AU is really a good place to find out more. Yeah. And and I'd love to go back a little bit to, you know, your history with, with life sciences, because I because I see there's, you know, there's so much opportunity as well. Um, and and do you have companies that are that are coming through again the technology centers focused on life sciences and and do you find that um, well certainly I, I'm sure you have an, an affinity for them but are you again are you seeing some trends in that realm as well that are really exciting for you? Yeah, we don't have actually many companies in the life sciences come through. Um, when they do though, it's focused around a new manufacturing technology or a new piece of equipment that they're bringing to market. Um, I would love to see more, of course, personally, especially around materials research. I think that's where there's potentially an interesting future, especially as we look through um, new technologies that are kind of brewing materials and brewing um new could also be drugs um 
but it could also be materials um, and fabrics. And how do we take that and actually take the sustainably, sustainable production of materials into a different area, which could be on the manufacturing side, which can be on the construction side. Um, and that's something that a lot of people, a lot of people are working on how that will fully connect into actual construction and actual manufacturing, I think still remains to be seen. I think there's some interesting work with um, mushroom leather that's happening right now in the fashion industry. Uh, there's also been a work with spider silk, um, which has very strong tensile strength. And all of that is just brewed like beer. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities there, but how that'll develop is still remains to be seen. <laughs> And, and are you seeing, so, you know, the, the, especially that type of research, you, know, you look at, you know, how AI can, can play a role. And it sounds like even, even with some of the work that you were doing prior, being able to, um, you know, run experiments, for example, and, you know, using different algorithms to kind of, you know, mechanize that system. Um, and, and then blockchain, not only to potentially open source some of the learnings and sort of level sets so that others can build on top of research, um, but also for ethical sourcing and for sourcing of some of these new materials. You know, how, how prevalent, you know, is that really, I mean, that sort of thought process, like, you know, are there companies that are really using all of these technologies or are you finding, again, there are companies with these specialties, as you described, that are kind of coming together and, com and combining forces? I think the more common mode of action that, that I personally see is that they have their specialties, but then they come together to combine them. The biggest strength is knowing when you're maybe not good in something um, and identifying that you want to be better in it and who is your partner to be successful. And I think that is a lot of the motivation for actually collaborating with other companies or academ academic partners or startups. Um, and that's the main mode that I see. I personally haven't seen somebody who brings everything together in a perfect blend. And the question is also, is that possible even? Yeah. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> no, and I, th I think you bring up a good point is, and I, you know, I always say the hallmark of a great founder is knowing what they don't know. But I think it's the same thing that, you know, if you're playing with too many emerging technologies, unless you have the, you know, best of the best in each of those disciplines, you know, you really run the risk of, of just trying to do too much. And, and so I think partnership is probably the way to go in the early days, but maybe we'll see more of these abilities within a single company in, in the future. And there's also no point in going after technology for the technology's sake. You need to have an application to act that actually will be solved by applying this technology. Um, otherwise, you're just going to waste effort and resources because nobody knows exactly what they're trying to solve. Right, exactly. It's a, it's a solution looking for a problem. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Something that we don't want to see with, with startups. And so I, of course, I, I, I have to go back to, to AR and, and maybe some of the other solutions that you're seeing out there and maybe you've seen come through the, the network, because especially in construction, being able to have um, even, you know, you know, mobile and iPad devices, but of course, when the wearables come out, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm sort of imagining this living BIM. The BIM data, right? That that's just overlays, and it and you are able to access whatever you know information at that moment is relevant to you at yeah. that particular location at that particular time, and and are you seeing some other interesting examples of that? You know that that building sites are starting to to leverage. Yeah, I think that's everyone's vision and hope that that's where we get for, and preferably also in the shape of regular safety glasses. Um, so no added. Technology yes, not two face. pairs of glasses. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I personally have not seen that fully come to life. Um, what I personally see most at this point is the iPad application and the iPhone application. And it's a very similar trend actually in life sciences and laboratories where you also have a similar challenge, by the way, you're busy with your hands all the time, but you kind of want to see all the data of what you're trying to do while you're doing it with your hands. Um, and so how do I best position my iPad, my iPhone, 
while I'm doing the work, like I can't really stick it to my body. So, right. so how do I do that? And I haven't, I mean, Google glasses was the big last goal that is a holy mm -hmm. grail that everybody hoped would get accomplished and get us somewhere. And I think that's, that's a good example of an innovation that we probably pushed too early. It wasn't ready for prime time, both because people didn't fully understand it, what to use it for. I don't need another way to look at my emails all the time. Um, it was a solution still looking for a problem, so to say, but at the same time in pushing something out too early and then it failing, right? Does that hinder the future progress for it to take off again and people to buy into it? No, I think I think it did. I think you're right to, to bring that up. I think it was a little bit too early. I think the other thing that may have been a challenge for them is having the outward facing cameras. So it was sort of throwing the baby out with the bathwater in that, you know, there was this uproar that, oh, now we're going to be recorded all the time. Of course, you know, the public just not realizing that we're, we've been recorded all the time for the last decade um, and more. Um, but, you know, that was the focus because it sort of came on the heels. Also, we had, um, you know, Snap, Snap Glasses came out shortly thereafter. And so, it was more about privacy and I think we lost the plot. Um, but I do think that, that it was, you know, it was amazing to have that product out there because it has allowed, I think the research to continue, but it's been a very long time now. And, you know, maybe by the end of, of this year, um, 2022 and potentially Q1 or 2021 and, and potentially Q1 2022, we may see these wearables that really look more like this from, from Apple and Facebook. They seem to be now sort of racing to get out to market. But I think that's going to yeah. make all the difference. And then to your point in, you know, lab or in a clean room or in, you know, many of these environments, in on a construction site, having a wearable, you know, combined with gesture control, combined with voice recognition, I think, again, that's where you start to see that combination of technologies layer in so that it's, you know, much more of an organic interaction. Yeah, and I, I think the difference between also now and like the first fad of Google Glasses and Snapchat is it there it was kind of for social media or for like for what, why would I do that, right? And it doesn't have a direct impact on really what I try to work or how to, how I earn my living or what I stand for as a human. And I think now that's a different situation. And I think that's also what we see in technology acceleration over the past 12, 18 months is that there's really much more acceptance for some of these solutions that either track our emotions or that integrate technology into our daily life because we all see a benefit that actually is something that's important to me. And Snapchat just would never be important enough to me to wear smart goggles. <laughs> yeah, no, and I and I hope that's the case. I'm I'm almost glad that they didn't take off and that we're not just using this technology to be able to, you know, film ourselves in 10 second disappearing increments. <laughs> it seems like a waste of very good technology. Yeah, indeed. And to me that somewhat also closes the loop to to life sciences or really any industry like the problems or the motivations that we see for solving certain problems are the same because it's again going back to the people and the business outcomes and how to combine them um and i see a lot of parallels there to my experience in the life sciences you can't push automation without the scientists being bought in you can't push automation on the construction sites without the workers being bought in it needs to be a symbiosis um, and that's so true across all industries that i see so that's a great point too you know introducing new technology into an existing workflow is always a challenge. And, and, you know, what are some of the ways that companies are able to, to kind of, you know, innovate in that way? Mm. What I see a lot in our network, it's through communications and through finding this initial champion, right? And that's also, of course, an age old technique, you need to find somebody who's in the group. Um, who's trusted by the audience you want to work with, who actually is a fan and can take your message and elevate it and adjust it for the audience. Um, but it really starts and ends with good communication. You can't come in there saying that you have the solution for everything for everyone, <laughs> especially if you don't come from this industry. Um, you need to listen and then speak their language 
to to connect it really to a need that everybody's having. I feel like that hasn't changed over the past 10, 20 years. We now just have better tools and technologies to find out some of the things. No, I think that's right. And I think just one of the basic tenets and, and not every you know, startup has a challenge with this, but I think there are startups where they're they're brilliant. They've built a brilliant product, but never once have they spoken to a potential customer. And you know, then going to market becomes incredibly difficult because you've never spoken to anyone and you don't really know what their challenges are. And it doesn't really matter at that point how brilliant the product is. Yes. And that can lead to huge backlash, especially now in the age of social media. Um, there's some interesting examples out there on the internet, especially recently. Yes, yes. Well, we, we won't name names. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so I, I would like to wrap up today with asking you the question that I ask everyone. And I, I think you're very well suited to this because I think you live a, a, a good part of your day in the future anyway with a lot of your startups that you're working with. Um, so if you project yourself 15, 20 years into the future and you look around and you have, you know, a product or a service that just makes your life better or makes you happy, what would it be and what would it do? Yeah, this connects back to my earlier uh, mention, actually, of brewing materials. So to me, it's kind of a Nespresso for brewing materials or medication or anything that you need. So that's kind of the gadget it would be you have like an espresso machine you put in your little capsule for making let's say um ibuprofen or the film capsule for making spider silk um, and you would just hit start it would start to brew and out comes a small amount but a personalized amount um, of the material that you were requesting i love so that's that my gadget <laughs> i love that and you know i think what's interesting too is you're in a position where that may just happen with one of your startups. So <laughs> that's yeah, why we asked well, the question. I'll motivate them. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It has been such a pleasure speaking with you, Connie. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me, Amy. It was a great, inspiring conversation also for me. Likewise, take care. <laughs>